Hey everyone, I'm Alan Thrall here at Untamed Strength Gym in Sacramento, California, and in this video I'm going to be talking about a trend that's floating around YouTube. I'm a little late to the party, but it's the top 10 exercises you would pick to speed ramp your progress. So if you were stripped of all your gains, sent back to square one, you can only do 10 exercises. Which 10 exercises would you pick to ensure you made the fastest progress back to where you are now? Alec Onkiri originally asked me to do this video, and after watching his, I can't argue with it, it's a near perfect list. I watched a couple of other YouTubers top 10 lists and I realized that there's a lot of personal preference in these lists. So I thought to myself, what 10 exercises would I pick? And to be honest, it was not hard to pick 10 exercises. It's hard to list 10 exercises in a convincing manner. And what I'm trying to say is I have a hard time convincing you guys that this exercise is so much better than that exercise. Unless we're talking about vastly different exercises like should I do the barbell back squat or a single arm band curl? Obviously, I'm gonna explain for a number of reasons why the barbell back squat is a better use of your time. But when we're comparing leg exercises, for example, some people will say, barbell back squat is king, you must do it. And I would have said this a few years ago. But the truth is, you can live a long, healthy, jacked life and never do barbell back squats. You can do a hack squat machine and build just as much muscle, and dare I say strength, doing a squat machine versus barbell squats. Obviously the person who's doing barbell squats is going to be able to barbell squat more than the person doing machines given everything is the same because barbell squatting requires some skill. But my point is this, when we talk about muscle hypertrophy, tendon, ligament, bone strength, whether you want to do free weights or machines, it doesn't really matter. You can even decide to never touch free weights or machines and just do body weight exercises and build plenty of muscle, given you can accumulate enough training volume. Meaning if you can only do one push up and zero pull ups, jumping on a push up pull up program might not be enough. You're actually gonna benefit from using some free weights to do like 50 reps, to use a lat pull down machine to do 50 reps. You're gonna be able to accumulate a lot more training volume. But even with that said, you could still modify body weight exercises and do elevated push-ups to get some volume. You could do inverted rows instead of pull-ups to get some training volume. So really, you could just use body weight exercises, build plenty of muscle, never touch machines, never touch free weights. So that was quite an intro. These are just all things that were running through my head when I'm trying to pick my top 10 list. And I didn't realize it at first, but I do now. These top 10 lists are not necessarily the top 10 best exercises, period. I really like the Alec listed top 10 exercises for strength, power, athleticism, or whichever terms he used. He identified a clear objective. I think a lot of the other guys are doing the top 10 exercises for aesthetics or for muscular hypertrophy. What I'm gonna do is list my top 10 exercises for a combination of strength, hypertrophy or muscle building, cardiovascular health, and enjoyment. I just like doing these exercises. Number one, front squats. Front squat is the natty squat. High bar squat is the creatine squat. Low bar squat is the fake natty, and geared squat is the steroid abuser. The front squat requires the most upright torso, the most knee flexion, and the forward most knee travel when compared to the back squat. For this reason, I feel like the front squat strengthens the legs best. Now believe me when I say any squat variation strengthens your legs. There's no magic power to front squats, and I'm not trying to make any bold claims. I'm just giving some anecdotal opinions. I feel like I can really focus on using my legs when I front squat. I can't cheat the squat by tilting over and using my back because that would cause the bar to roll forward off my shoulders. After a tough day of front squats, I also feel DOMS in my upper back region, something I don't get much at all with back squats. So there must be some upper back muscle building occurring. And I'm not sure why, but my obliques get really tired and sore after front squats. There just seems to be more going on when I front squat, and that's why it's my favorite. I also think about transferability of exercises to movements. As a strongman competitor, I'm always standing up with objects in front of my body. Log clean, Atlas stone load, sandbag, Husafel, Conan's wheel, the list goes on. When I front squat, I have a mind movement connection, kind of like a mind muscle connection. I imagine I'm standing up with a heavy stone or a heavy log. I just like front squats. Number two, deadlifts. I realized the first two were pretty obvious. I can't imagine a strength training program where I'm not picking something up off the ground. Upper back, traps, grips, spinal erectors, glutes, and hamstrings all benefit from a deadlift. I need an exercise that I can train heavy. Deadlifts are that exercise. 
There's actually a lot of variation with the deadlift too, so in a way I'm cheating this list by picking an exercise with several additional lifts built in. Conventional deadlift, sumo deadlift, wide grip, hack deadlift, Romanian deadlift, stiff leg, zercher, one leg deadlift, and many more. Number three, cleans. The deadlift is for moving heavy weight slowly. Cleans are for moving heavy weight fast. It's a pull and a squat that also trains explosiveness, balance, coordination, and I think it's one of the best trap builders. The violent second pull is not replicated anywhere else in the gym, so the clean has some unique advantages. This movement demands intensity and commitment. You cannot pull a heavy clean slowly. You cannot jump under a heavy barbell slowly. You have to commit to getting under the heavy weight as fast as possible, which is why I think the clean is one of the best exercises for training grit and determination, as well as technique and finesse. Donnie Schenkel says it best. Imagine me having a punch that can knock out, you know, a fucking rhino in front of me. But you got a piece of thread in between your knuckles. There's an eye of a needle right in front of that beast's face. You not only have to have the power to put him down, but you have to thread the needle at the same time. Plus, Donnie Shankle is Bigger Than You is one of the best training videos on YouTube. Step in front. One of the first exercises I did in the weight room in preparation for high school football was clean complexes jump shrugs, high pulls, cleans, back to back to back, sometimes for eight reps each. Again, back to back to back. I think this prepared me well for high school sports, and I enjoyed the clean so much that I was able to set a high school record for my weight class, 265 pound clean at 17 years old, about 120 kilos. It was a foundational exercise in my formative year of lifting weights. You're gonna notice that's a reoccurring theme for a lot of these exercises. Number four, gonna be a curveball. Running. I think everyone should run in some capacity. Jog, sprint, run up a hill. Within this YouTube space of strength training, we like to talk about the fundamental movements that we should all train. Squat, hinge, press, pull. I think running belongs here too. Maybe even jumping, but that's a little bit more specific. Personally, I think sprinting is to squatting what push-ups are to bench press. Take that for what it's worth. Having the physical ability to jog somewhere is important, just like having the ability to pick up something heavy. It's included in my bubble of what it means to be physically capable. And like I mentioned in this video linked on the screen, running used to be my measure of physical ability, just like powerlifters use squat bench deadlift as their metric. It was a foundational exercise in my youth, so if given the chance to do it all over again, running would still be there. Strength training enthusiasts like to talk about being physically ready for anything life throws at them. Compound strength movements are functional and prepare you for life. I totally agree with this. If you were ever caught in a situation in which you needed to use your strength, it's a good thing to have strength in your arsenal of physical abilities. Being able to jog or sprint somewhere is also very important. Some people might even add fighting to this list, which I think would be a good addition. But even if you don't care about being gas station ready, Running, jogging, or interval sprint training is good for your health. Running doesn't need to be hard and intense. There are a number of benefits in training zone two cardio, which is about 70 to 80% of your maximum heart rate. So if your heart rate, maximum heart rate is 175 beats per minute, 70 to 80% of that is 122 to 140 beats per minute. If you don't run, you're not gonna have to do much to stay in that zone. Short bouts of slow jogging followed by power walking for 20 to 30 minutes is probably all you need at first. And if you're thinking, can't I just do cardio machines to get the same zone two cardiovascular benefits as running? Yes, you can. But running doesn't require equipment or a gym membership, and it can be done anywhere at any time. If jogging or sprinting is uncomfortable for you, start by jogging up a hill. It's less impact than flat or downhill running. I've made a couple of videos about running and lifting weights that I'll attach on the screen and link them down below in the description box. Number five, push press. The push press is my favorite pressing movement. You don't need a bench to do it. You can seamlessly transition from squats to push press because the rack height is the same and you get to use more weight than a strict press. In all seriousness, I do remember a time when all I did was strict press, making some progress, but albeit very slow progress. My thinking was, if I improve my strict press, my push press will automatically improve with it. Unfortunately, that wasn't really the case for me. And I remember when all I was doing was strict press, 
I finally added in a push press after a long break from doing it. And the following couple of days, I was surprisingly sore in my side and front delts and my triceps. I felt like I did a shoulder tricep high volume bodybuilding day. This was a good soreness, not a beat up painful soreness. And I understand that being sore does not equal productivity, but it means there was some sort of novel demand there. And it makes sense when I think about it. It was kind of a light bulb going off in my head. It is a pressing overload movement. The help of my legs allows me to use more weight. The top half of the movement is really stressing my triceps. And sometimes we forget about the usefulness of the eccentric phase or the lowering phase of these barbell movements. I was locking out a heavy weight, trying to resist this heavy weight from crashing down my body, and my shoulders were working overtime to help lower the barbell slowly. This probably explains some of the novel stimulus that I experienced. From a performance and athletic viewpoint, the push press develops body control, kinesthetic awareness. You have to use your lower body and upper body in fluid synchronization to execute the lift. This is something you'll see when you watch Olympic weightlifting. And you'll notice on the other end of that, some strongman competitors who do not move very well, they might have a good strict press, but a marginally better push press. Sometimes no difference between the two. Their push press looks like a quarter squat, pause, come up, pause, and then a strict press, rather than a powerful fluid motion. And people will see a strong overhead press and say, oh my goodness, he practically strict pressed it. I wonder what he could push press. When the answer is the exact same amount, because he doesn't know how to push press. Now, if your strict press is good enough to win competitions, continue doing what you're doing. I'm getting off topic now. The last thing I'll say about push press, it requires some shoulder and upper back mobility. When done often, it improves those things. A good push press rack position doesn't just support the weight in your hands, it supports the barbell across your collarbones, your shoulders, ultimately right on top of your torso. Your upper back needs to extend far enough to support the bar. A flexed or rounded upper back with elbows down, a hyperextended lower back, hips forward, maybe even knees bent, is not a strong base for push press. So a good push press forces you to fix this problem. And for all those reasons, the push press is my favorite pressing movement. Number six and seven, I'm gonna to group together, push-ups and pull-ups. It's what our grandfathers and grandmothers used to get jacked. If it works for them, it can work for you. Push-ups and pull-ups round out any physique and they are the foundation of strength. It's a shame that they don't get enough credit. People will do all they can to learn about programming, they'll watch videos about this machine and that machine, what this Olympian does, what supplements to take. Hell, they'll even watch videos about steroids when they don't even lift. And people will pay a trainer or an online coach before even touching push-ups and pull-ups. Zach Evanesh has said it before, and I'm paraphrasing, something like, if you need to hire me as a coach to do push-ups and pull-ups, you're not gonna go very far. It's simple, a little harsh, but truthful. Skipping out on push-ups and pull-ups for everything else is like stepping over dollar bills to pick up a quarter. Like I mentioned at the beginning of this video, if you can't do a push-up or a pull-up, there's no shame in using free weights or machines to build some strength while probably needing to lose some body weight, but you could just modify those two exercises and get started anywhere, anytime with zero money. Variations seem endless for push-ups and pull-ups. Elevated push-ups, push-ups on your knees, wide push-ups, narrow push-ups, diamond push-ups, banded push-ups, depths of push-ups, explosive push-ups, tempo push-ups. You got wide grip pull-ups, narrow grip pull-ups, chin-ups, neutral grip, jumping pull-ups, negatives, banded pull-ups, even just one and two arm static hangs. Even monkey bars could be considered a pull-up variation. From a quick practical standpoint, push-ups, especially push-ups. For me, they are such a great way to get a lot of volume in my upper body routine. I can tolerate hundreds of push-ups in a weekly routine. I do not want to do hundreds of reps of bench press within a week. And again, I can do them anywhere, anytime. Are your kids napping and you can't leave to go to the gym? Because apparently society says you can't drive across town just to lift weights while your newborn baby sleeps at home. Just knock out as many push-ups as you can in 20 minutes. You can even do 20 sets of 10 reps every minute on the minute. 20 sets of five reps every minute on the minute. 20 sets of one rep every minute on the minute. Whatever you can do. Number eight, lunges. I wanted to include a unilateral movement in this list and walking barbell lunges are always a good choice. I can't convince you that they're better than split squats, stationary lunges, step ups, pistol squats, lateral lunges, and whatever else you can name. But I can say that I've always done them and I really like doing them. I used to do five sets of 20 reps. That's like 100 reps. 
with as heavy as 185 pounds on the bar. I would take a barbell and plates out to the football field at the Marine Barracks in DC and lunge back and forth across the football field. It was such a fond memory for me and that's why they have a special place in my heart. People like to really push squats or leg press. Why not barbell lunges? They aren't just a fit chick booty builder done with a colorful foam bar. And not only are they a great leg and glute builder, they can improve balance, coordination, and flexibility. Number nine, farmer's carry. Going back to number four, those basic movements that we like to talk about. Squat, hinge, press, pull, run, and carry. Grab a weight with your bare hands and take a walk. Heavy weight for short distance, lighter weight for longer distance, multiple hard sets, one long set, any way you'd like. Your hands, forearms, traps, core, hip flexors, glute medius will all benefit from farmer's walks. Deadlifts, barbell rows, dumbbell rows, pull-ups are all excellent grip builders, but a heavy farmer's walk can train your grip harder than anything else. Since this is my list, I'll add a touch of anecdote. When I was training to become a body bearer in the Marine Corps, we would carry trash cans, shit cans, with 45 pound plates inside. How far, you ask? until we failed, and then again, and then again, and then again, and then later in the day, five days a week. This prepared us for a heavy casket carry across Arlington Cemetery. Imagine how that would look if our grip wasn't strong enough to finish a long carry. I'm convinced that this training laid a solid base for my farmer's wall grip strength today. And finally, number 10, hanging leg raises. These can be done by hanging with your bare hands or with the arm strap that goes around your triceps. For me, it was a toss up between hanging leg raises, ab wheel rollouts, and planks. So I picked this one because of the added grip benefit if you do it with your bare hands. These can be done with bent knees, straight legs, or even knees to elbows, which you'll really feel in your lats. So this has to count as a distant variation of a pull up. And again, I added this exercise because it was one of the staple exercises in my training routine as a kid. So if I had to do it all over again, I would keep this in there. With that said, I actually didn't do hanging leg raises. I did lying leg raises with a partner standing at my head, throwing my legs down, 10 straight, 10 right, 10 left, 10 straight. Then you and your partner would switch. The goal was to try to kick your partner in the stomach and your partner would try to throw your legs down into submission. It was great for your abs, great for team bonding, and I still remember the smell of stinky teenager's shoes that would be stuck on your hands for the rest of the day. We called these Zeratis. So that's it, that's my top 10 list. Comment your top 10 list down below, or if you disagree with anything I said, let me hear it. Thanks for watching and always remember, Trend on Time!